Hey guys, on today's episode, we're gonna be pulling out this Pontiac Le Mans 350 out of a garage in Greenwich, Connecticut, bringing it back up to the shop, cleaning it up, and hopefully getting it running. That and a whole lot more in this episode, Drive the Tech. I received a call from Andy at North American Motor Car asking me to come down to Greenwich to take a look at a convertible they found in a garage and to see if there was anything that could be done to salvage the original paint. With the garage door open, it was obvious that the car had been sitting there for a very long time. It had spider webs and flat tires, which is all fine and good. The big concern was the passenger side, which had a wood stack leaning against it. So I didn't have super high hopes at first, but I wanted to understand a bit more about the history of this particular car. It's a 1969 Pontiac Le Mans convertible. It's my first car, and I've had it all these years, and it's been in this particular garage for 22 years because I couldn't part with it. I'm hoping it can be restored back to its original glory, and when I win the lottery, I'll buy it back. <laughs> After closer inspection, I thought I might have a chance at bringing back the original paint, convertible top, and the interior. So the deal was then sealed and the NAMC hauler backed into the driveway. The boys did all the paperwork, filled up the tires, hooked up the chains underneath, and surprisingly, it actually rolled up into the bed easy enough. Once it was on the lift, the license plate was removed and returned to the owner. If you notice in the upper right hand corner of the plate, it says 2001. I, just for reference, I graduated high school in 2000. Once the car was out of the garage, we cleaned up the wood for the owner and then actually filled the bed of the pickup truck with really old dry wood, which is great for a fireplace. Looking at the floor, you can see egg corns, bits of nest, and one random frog. So I knew I was gonna find some friends during the detail later on. And with that, the Le Mans was loaded up, the ladies waved goodbye, and off to the studio we went. Underneath the studio lights, you can really see the extent of the dirt, grime, spiderweb, mold, and layer of filth from sitting forever. The inside was also a hot mess. Boy, that stinks like poo poo. But I was a bit more concerned about the scratches running down the length of the passenger side, which I'm assuming was from the stack of wood. Step one is to fill the foam gum with Brute for some extra kick for very obvious reasons, and then foam in the wash bucket, Brute in the wheel bucket, before round one of power washing the paint. Enjoy. On the convertible top, I used Titan 12 degreaser and a red brush to scrub the caked on grime, and after the first pass, it looked pretty good. Next, I quickly rinsed, degreased the rubber, and then cleaned the hubcaps. For the paint, I sprayed on Brute and let it soak for a little while as every seam and crevice was just full of junk before scrubbing the exterior with microfiber towels and small brushes.
afterwards, I finished with a healthy rinse and you could almost feel the car losing about five pounds of dirt. It was such a satisfying ride. Now, out of pure curiosity, I lifted the Le Mans up to see what the undercarriage looked like, and I found this. As you can imagine, the muffler became one of the many homes I found throughout the car. The next day, with the car back down on the ground, as there was absolutely nothing reasonable that I could clean underneath it, I opened up the hood to see if installing a jumper box would allow me to lower the convertible top, but no dice. I had to try anyways. I was a very small chance of that happening, but whatever. Anyways, I ended up finding an after party to the muffler mouse house yeah. under the hood. Again, more on this, a whole lot more on this later. So before working on the interior, which was incredibly moldy and of course packed with poo, I wanted to put on my bunny suit to avoid burning yet another set of clothes like I did after the Bricklin detail. I'm never going to be able to go home again. Step one on interiors this dirty is to get the majority of the heavy or scoopable junk up first. Sort of think of it like a mow down on the paint, sort of like mow down on the interior. In other words, it's not going to be perfect after round one, but I also used a scrub pad as well on the seats just to kind of help lift as much as possible. And after a few passes, I then had to rinse out the scrub pad and look at the disgusting color that came out. For those of you keeping track, the towels in the background of that particular shot are actually being tossed out and they're in the sink just because they're garbage and I didn't get to the garbage. So if you're wondering, those are garbage. For round two of cleaning the interior, I recleaned the seats again, but this time I did it with my steamer. The brown junk just oozed off the seats. So the trick is you heat it up first, yes. put the product on, then heat it again. Yeah. Comes out perfect every time. Again, still a lot more to go, but we're moving in the right direction. I repeated the same steps on the rest of the interior. After the steam and the brushing, I used the sniper steamer, I call it the one little nozzle, to blow out all the seams and the crevices, especially on the steering wheel. With everything sort of warmed up at this point on the steering wheel, on the wider areas, I used the stitch and seam brush and just goopy brown stuff just flaked off. It was absolutely disgusting. On the floor, I used lather and an interior brush to scrub the floor mat area and the gas and brake pedals. Even after cleaning the pedals, a bunch of rocks were stuck in the grooves, so I used a mini flathead screwdriver to clean out all the seams. After using compressed air to dislodge all the remaining dirt, it was now time to quickly vacuum up the floor to remove those little bits of debris that flew everywhere so that they didn't clog up my steam shampoo machine that steams and sucks up moisture all in one and leaves behind a drier carpet in those particular situations. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next coming videos, but on heavier areas, I use my regular shampoo machine to suck up the extra dirt, but I now know that I have to allocate a little bit more time for that to dry properly. So keep that in mind if you deem this step necessary as I did in, again in this particular spot here. Finally, as a last step, I wiped down the seats with Ammo Digest because of all the mouse poop and other organic matter caused by animal waste, I wanted to get that up and kind of get my last little wipe down. 
Then afterwards, I wanted to run a quick test to see how effective my three cleaning steps were with the Hygiena tester. And the grossest spot that I could think of was the steering wheel, which of course passed, not with flying colors by any means, but it still passed nonetheless. And I'm feeling a little bit better about the mechanic that's gonna go in there and work on it in the future. As sort of a last resort, and because I had to focus on the outside of the car, I installed an ozone machine to zap whatever else was left inside the car while I had hours of other exterior work to, to do. So it's kind of a good use of your time. If you do the interior first, put an ozone machine and then spend the rest of the time on the outside. Okay, at this point, the outside is kind of clean, meaning we washed it, but nothing else. The inside is much better, a little bit safer. I now focused all my energy on the engine compartment. Now, again, let me be super clear. This isn't an engine detail by any means, but more of a removal of bacteria so that the mechanic, hopefully in the future, the next couple of days, will work on it and not get bitten or get some sort of disease or whatever. Oh, oh that's the scary home. Uh -huh. <laughs> The first step was to bag the acorns and bits of nest. Then I quickly vacuumed with an open hose to get the majority of the junk before power washing. But as soon as I finished there, I found the true source of the nest inside the hood, along with the little guy who called the Lamonts his home over all these years. Oh, that's a dead mouse. So back to the garbage I went to refill the bag of grossness, and then I revacuumed. Next, I sprayed much of the loose stuff away with the pressure washer and then used the compressed air to move most of the hidden debris that was inside the engine away in anticipation of getting started with Ted in a few days. Now, while I was doing this, I realized I forgot to check the air filter, which again was another home to a mouse. I removed the nest and threw away the air filter before vacuuming up the remaining bits. As I mentioned before, this is not a perfect job by any means, but it's enough for a mechanic to get going without some crazy surprise. Okay guys, at this point, I am pretty excited. We did the interior. It looks absolutely amazing compared to what it was. Is it Pebble Beach? No, but it's way safer. I can't express to you the smell that was here. Absolutely horrific. Plus, uh, believe it or not, it's kind of exciting. I had a New York Times uh, guy who's writing an article for Lifestyle. Uh, hopefully it comes out by the time this video is out or maybe before, I don't know, but uh, super cool guys. So thanks for coming along and uh, watching me clean the interior. But anyhow, we shampooed. I have an ozone machine in there. We're letting it do its thing. Now, the part that I'm really excited about is polishing the paint. Now, if you can see right here, I did a test spot. This is what a pad is still in the bag. Looks like from the beginning, this is what it looks like after one pass. So clearly it's single stage. Tons and tons and tons of residue is coming off this car. Totally normal. And I would say typical for something that's been sitting for as long as this one has. You can see there is just junk everywhere on here. We have to basically exfoliate the skin, kind of go like this if we were in the shower of one of those scrub pads. Same kind of concept here. I think it's gonna look absolutely amazing when we're done. Only thing left to do, headphones on, polish this paint. I haven't been excited about polishing a paint like this in a very long time. So let's do this. To demonstrate the cleaning ability of the machines, polishes, and pads, I did a quick 50-50 on the trunk. As you can clearly see, it looks much better than the unpolished area, but if you're wondering why it still looks swirled out, that's a good question. All right, guys, I'm behind the camera right now. Check this out. This is obviously the before, clearly the after. You can see the light difference. Huge, huge, huge difference. Again, is this gonna be Pebble Beach? No, but I mean, look at the difference. There you go, How about, oh, let's do this. Take this guy off. Okay, now look at the hexagrid lights from there to there. I'm really just cleaning the heck out of it. Now, if you look closely, you see all these like, what looks like swirls from a detailing perspective? That, that is not swirls, that is just the paint underneath cracking. So there's all these little like crazing and a little bit of crow's feet. I mean, there's all kinds of fun stuff going on here, but all these things you see underneath the light right there. Here, let's find one right there. That's just not swirls. I'll never get that out. That's from underneath. It's just, it's just old paint. It is what it is. But if you exfoliate hexagrid there, hexagrid there, you know, you, you've saved the car, so to speak. It's, maybe someone doesn't have to paint it right now and they're just gonna live with that because they wanna, you know, it's good enough or whatever. So really, really excited to do the rest of this car. The before and after is gonna be amazing. Oh, wow, look at that, that's awesome. The before and after is gonna be so cool in this. And I'm gonna chrome out the bump, you know, do the best I can to chrome out the bumpers. And I gotta take the, I'm pretty sure those are hubcaps. I gotta take those off and do like each one individually, uh, which is gonna be super fun. Look, in between all those things, I think I can kind of shine that up like crazy. By the end, this thing's gonna start uh, looking pretty good. 
Okay, today is a fresh day, believe it or not. Yesterday we got hit with a hurricane and we're still getting the uh, backside of it or the remnants of it. Now this morning uh, I did this side right here. You can see uh, duck done. It is pretty shiny. It looks great for a car in this condition, of course. And I did one thing, I switched up. I went to this pad. This is the uh, Meguiar's foam in red. Uh, I've done an airplane uh, with a bunch of really great dudes out in Arizona and Kevin Brown, of course, uh, and a couple of other cars. When there's tons of residue coming off the paint, uh, you have to control it a certain way. And if you have a microfiber cutting pad, it tends to cut through that really well. So you're gonna get a really good cut, but on something like this, where I'm obviously not gonna make this into a show car, I'm just trying to exfoliate all the dead skin. These pads tend to hold that residue better than let's say microfiber cutting pads or wool pads for that matter. Why? Because they're cutting so much, the wool and the microfiber, they're cutting so much, which is really great in certain circumstances. This is so soft and so much is coming off. It just it kind of chokes the pad. When it chokes the pad, it pushes the rest of it, which cannot, like if you just filled your mouth up with food, the rest of the donut can't get in there. So it's sticking out here. It's, it's sticking to the paint. It becomes very challenging to get off. This one, for whatever reason, holds the residue much better. And when it holds the residue much better, it makes it so that you can wipe it off uh, a lot easier and then take your air and blow out whatever's, uh, uh, you know, that you took off the paint. So in a long story short, the red, Foam pad is way better on cars that have a ton of residue coming off and you're not looking for like pure pebble beach perfection. If not, go back to the other method. So I'm gonna fly through the rest of this car using this pad and I'm pretty stoked with compound as well. Okay, so we're about halfway through the car and you can see the pad is pretty caked up. Put it in the light behind me there, see that? Uh, so at some point you are gonna have to clean it to do that. I'm using a little bit of uh, soap, whatever you have, Dawn. I have uh, Johnson head-to-head -head baby wash or baby shampoo. So turn on the water. You're just gonna use your hand, have it a little bit warm. There it is. And you're just gonna scrub it in like this. Let me move the camera up. Play like this. You're gonna see it start to turn red again. Scrub it with your fingers. Give a squeeze, watch. Get a blue that's coming out. Then blow out the pad to avoid making a total mess, which is still kind of likely to happen on your first few passes, but it's better than working with a totally caked up pad. It just doesn't work well. Up next, I focused on the chrome bumpers. Now, they were in desperate need of a polish, but first, I carefully removed the sticker with a razor blade, and you can see how it might look underneath the sticker when I'm done, so that was pretty encouraging. At first, I used a power tool, and then I went to a microfiber towel by hand, and I wasn't getting the best results, and it wasn't super ergonomic or really comfortable, so I went back to my trusty microfiber disc on a DA polisher. Now, let me be clear, you can use a microfiber towel by hand. It's going to work great. It's going to get into those little tight spots, but you can also use a microfiber pad on a DA. It's going to work much faster and you're not going to have any finger strain or hand strain. At the end of the day, being comfortable is super important when you're working on a car like this, because if you do multiple ones, meaning one or two or three a week, by the end of the week, your hands are just going to be killing you. The one thing you do need to keep in mind with a DA polisher is when you get into those tight spots, it could be a little bit more challenging. So you may need to go down to a three inch or just decide to use your hand in those tight spots. Next, I popped off all four hubcaps and brought them outside for a quick cleaning with plum and the wheel brush in between the spokes. Then I cleaned the mud off the tires and the rusted out wheels, blew out the hubcaps with air, and replaced them on the original tires for now.
Then I finished up on the disgusting glass and used a scrub pad to lift the caked on grime before scooping it up with a microfiber towel. Then I used Obey once again, this time I did it with a squeegee and the before and after was massive. As my very last touch, I wanted to apply a little bit of mousse, especially to the front dashboard as it was just totally dried out and I did the rest of the interior as well and it was starting to look much better. Well guys, that's it. This car looks absolutely amazing. Uh, probably one of the most intricate and fun details I've done in a long time. Uh, the previous owner was a super sweet lady uh, and I'm hoping uh, that we can show it to her again and, and, and sort of bring back those memories. Uh, I'm dying to bring this down to her, but we have a, a whole lot of work to do. We have to take it over to NAMC and see if we can get this engine turned over. I think The next day, the trailer from NAMC was going to show up, but I actually remembered I forgot to check the trunk. So here's what's inside the trunk. Some wood, springs, rubber mat, a yellow cover, the convertible cover, and a spare tire. Overall, it looked pretty good. There wasn't any rust, so I just quickly vacuumed and I waited for the trailer. Once Steve arrived, he hooked up the winch and pulled it into the trailer, leaving behind my disgusting floor, but it was on its way to the North American Motor Car to see the magician Ted, who's going to start the process of trying to get this thing back on the road. First, he lifted the car, placed it on jock stands, and slid the oil catch underneath. Once unplugged, the oil looked and smelled really dirty. Next, he removed the filter, filled a new one with fresh oil, and replaced it. On top, the air filter housing was removed, <coughs> funnel added, and five fresh quarts were poured in. The next step is pretty interesting. I didn't see this one coming. He cut the fuel line so it didn't suck in any of the old fuel from 22 years ago. The goal was just to see if this car turns over, and he can do that with the carburetor and putting a little bit of fuel in there just to see if this thing has a little bit of life left in it. To that end, he removed the spark plug so that oil could be placed in the cylinder walls to lubricate the metal-on-metal metal action from the piston as it moves up and down. To do this, he uses a little oil can and puts oil in each of the cylinders and then rotates the fan to get the oil inside moving around a little bit. And you can see right here, it actually squirts out in one of the cylinders. Afterwards, the valve covers are removed, revealing the condition of the lifters and the springs, which, all things considered, didn't look too bad from what I'm being told. That hasn't seen the light of day in 20, oh, probably since 1969. Then he used an electric drill to prime the engine with oil first for safety. Now, as you can see, the oil is oozing out of the lifter area, which is a great sign. Next, he installed the battery, fixed the connection, replaced some of the parts on the distributor, gapped the new plugs, and then replaced them all. Finally, we added fuel to the carburetor and gave it a go. Go ahead. Yes! <laughs> so the first few attempts were pretty cool and it wanted to go, but the popping and all the fireballs, although exciting to see and encouraging, was really not the end goal. So more work needed to be done to sustain a steady idle. The next day, I returned to NAMC to find Ted had already installed a brand new distributor because we think that was the issue, put on the valve covers, put a new belt on, and all of this was done with renewed optimism. Sounded amazing. Yeah, now clearly, this beast has a long way to go, but we got through the first step of the process and had a lot of fun doing it. Now, my mission is to hopefully find a new home for the Le Mans where it can be loved and rebuilt and, of course, get back on the road once again. To find out more information on this and the many other cars, visit NorthAmericanMotorCar.com. As always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe and turn the notification bell on to be notified of our next episode. Here's a sneak peek of what's coming. Thanks for watching.